Good morning in the US, good afternoon in the UK, and good evening in China. Welcome to the inaugural event of the webinar series, Engineering's Role in Catalyzing COVID-19 Response, Recovery, and Resilience, a production by the US National Academy of Engineering, the Chinese Academy of Engineering, and the United Kingdom's Royal Academy of Engineering. My name is John Anderson, and I am the president of the National Academy of Engineering, which is serving as the host for this event. The global consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic are extraordinary and continue to pose significant challenges for countries around the world. Engineers have been in the forefront of providing solutions to these challenges. One recent example of engineering contributions to combating the pandemic was the extraordinarily effective effort to quickly determine the genetic makeup of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and make it freely available online. This pro global project required the following, biomedical engineers and chemical engineers to design the sequencing steps used in, to characterize the virus, mechanical engineers to develop the fluidic system to move nanoliters of material accurately through the instrumentation, optical and electrical engineers to provide the sensors needed to detect the sequencing reactions, materials engineers to create diagnostic platforms that survive aqueous environments, and computer scientists and engineers to develop the hardware and software needed to extract information from the terabytes of data that this effort produced. Such contributions are under-recognized among the general public, even among some scientists and engineers. One purpose of this seminar series is to address this deficit in understanding, to highlight engineering's role in meeting societal needs in times of adversity, and to recognize the pandemic-related engineering advances that the United States, China, and the United Kingdom have made. The webinar today addresses initial COVID-19 responses, the first R in the Response, Recovery, and Resilience seminar theme. It highlights the actions taken during the Apollo 13-like phase of the pandemic, where engineers were taking whatever they had on hand and trying to shape it into solutions as quickly and efficiently as possible. As you will hear, our speakers were at the center of three such responses in the US, the UK, and China. They will detail the steps that they and colleagues took to respond to urgent needs for personal protective equipment and medical devices. Their talks will be followed by a discussion where three additional experts will join with them to explore the challenges faced by engineers in accomplishing this work. The webinar will be moderated by Dr. Harvey Feinberg, an internationally recognized leader in global health. In particular, assessment of medical technology, evaluation and use of vaccines, and dissemination of medical innovations. Dr. Feinberg is currently the president of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and previously served as president of the U.S. Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine. Most recently, Dr. Feinberg chaired the National Academy's Standing Committee on Emerging Infectious Diseases and 21st Century Health Threats, which advised the executive branch of the U.S. government on its response to COVID-19. It is now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Ming Che. Ming is the chairman, CEO, and founder of Fulgent, a leading genetic testing and molecular information company and the headline sponsor of this webinar series. Fulgent has made significant contributions to addressing the challenges of COVID-19. Since March 2020, the company has commercially launched several tests for the detection of SARS-CoV-2, including next-generation sequencing and reverse transcription PCR-based tests. Prior to Fulgent, Ming was the chairman, CEO, and founder of Cogent, a biometric identification services and pr products company he co-founded in 1990, which was acquired by the 3M company in 2010. Mr. Mr. Che holds four U.S. and international patents. He was elected a member of the National Academy of Engineering in 2015. He received the Ellis Island Medal of Honor in 2017, and he was elected a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors in 2018. He is an active member and supporter of the NAE, for which we are profoundly grateful. He is also a philanthropist 
to various other organ institutions and has been instrumental in fostering international efforts to promote engineering education and cancer research. Ming, I'm proud to call you my friend and thank you and Fulgent for your generous sponsorship of this webinar series. Please welcome Ming Cheng. Thank you, Zhao. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Fulgent Genetics is very pleased to sponsor today's seminar, which has been organized in conjunction with the National Academy of Engineering, the China National Academy of Engineering, and the UK Royal Academy of Engineering. It is great to see some of our colleagues and staff members again since we met during the 2019 Global Grand Challenges Summit in London. Being an engineer myself, I have been always striving to make the world a better place. And it had become apparent to me at a young age that a good education is vital for new generation of students, scientists, engineering to thrive. As a member of the National Academy of Engineering and Chairman CEO of Fulgen Genetics, I'm very proud to join today's events to encourage collaborations and innovations combating the current pandemic. It has been especially critical during this period that the scientists, engineering around the world have worked together to share data, research effort, and engineering resource in a collaborative manner to evoke a unified response for diagnosis, treatment, prevention of the pandemic. In early 2020, based on the viral genomic sequence data worn by WHO, Fulgen Genetic recognized needs of pivot resource from our clinical genetic tests to focus our engineering efforts to quickly develop a series RT-PCR based virus detect test or COVID-19 test with a rapid turnaround time and the superior test accuracy. In addition, we also needed to develop a high throughput and robust NGS genomic sequence test, helping the researchers to track on the COVID-19 variations. Within two months, we developed a test method, validated the chemistry reagent, secured the sample collection kits, and created logistic management infrastructure. Based on the through build a high throughput testing capacity and receive the FDA emergency use authorization. Since April 2020, Fulgen Genetics have been in the forefront of the battle against the pandemic, taking early steps to launch robust testing solutions with today's uh, being leveraged by various organizations across the United States, including hospitals, school system, municipalities, government agencies, and the private enterprise and the individual citizens. We processed more than 10 million COVID-19 tests less than one year. In addition, Fulgen Genetics is a top commercial organization working closely with the US CDC to aid ongoing research tracking the spread and a new mutation of the virus. Our experience at the Fulgen is very relevant to today's discussion, which focuses on how engineering innovations have helped the organizations as they have taken swift action to support the battle against the pandemic. Fulgen Genetics is pleased to support actions of the NAE in a worldwide collaboration with the National Academies of China and the United Kingdoms, as they have identified and highlighted the most innovative engineering systems and the solutions to battle the pandemic. Today's speaker have taken unique approach to their pandemic responses, but one key piece of response has been engineering innovations 
across these organizations. We proud of the effort of the individuals today that truly made a difference by their early actions in response to the pandemic for the benefit of the great world. Their actions demonstrate how advancement in engineering in collaboration with scientific research can drive positive change for our society. With that, I will attend our discussion to Dr. Harvey Feinberg, who was introduced by the Dr. Anderson uh, earlier. So Dr. Feinberg. Thank you so much, Ming. Uh, thank you for the many contributions of Fulgent to the current pandemic. Thank you for your inspiring words this morning, afternoon or evening. And thank you especially for your generous support that makes this webinar series possible. I wanna express my appreciation also to John Anderson for his warm introduction. I would like to say to all, this is going to be an opportunity to hear from some of the most creative and effective problem solvers in engineering, facing a crisis in countries all around the world. I have the great honor of serving as a moderator of today's program on engineering's role in catalyzing COVID-19 response, recovery, and resilience. As we have heard, this is the first webinar in a series on engineering innovations in response to the challenges of the pandemic. We'll begin today's webinar hearing from three speakers, one from the United States, one from China, and one from the United Kingdom. Each of these speakers was faced with a critical challenge. How can they quickly, efficiently, successfully mobilize engineering resources that are needed to meet the need for critical medical supplies or equipment to deal with a burgeoning pandemic. And the colleagues with whom they worked, in some cases, unlikely partnerships were formed, came together to create innovative solutions to a problem that remains with us and that they will share in terms of the solutions they created today. We will follow their presentations with a roundtable discussion. We'll bring in three additional participants to add their perspectives and discuss together the challenges of engineering on the fly, engineering in real time to meet critical needs in an extremely demanding circumstance. We'll begin today with our first speaker, Rodney Hanberger. Mr. Hanberger is the Vice President and Technical Director of the Personal Safety Division of 3M, St. Paul, Minnesota. Since starting with the company in 1997, he's worked in various roles as an engineer, researcher, and manager, including development of medical devices, personal care components, and a variety of personal protective equipment. From 2013 to 2015, Mr. Hanberger led 3M's safety and graphics laboratories in China. In 2015, he took responsibility for the company's global respiratory R&D team. Over the past year, he has experienced the challenges of working through technical, regulatory, engineering, and end user challenges that have arisen during the course of the pandemic. His remarks today are entitled, Foundation and Flexibility, Overcoming Technical Challenges During the Pandemic. Let's now hear from Mr. Hanberger. Thank you, Dr. Feinberg. Um, is my, uh, it's, I'm proud today to be here today to share our experience over the last 17 months of the pandemic. Um, while the cause is tragic, um, it has been an amazing experience learning about um, of the resiliency of people, the ability of people to innovate. Um, and throughout the tragedy, despite all of the challenges we hear, um, and sometimes even the scourge of, of people taking advantage for every example of that, we have a thousand examples of people stepping up, being truly selfless. 
um, and helping each other. And uh, that's, uh, I think, the foundation that I will uh, start with before I talk. Um, at any rate, uh, over the past five years, as Dr. Feinberg noted, I've had the pleasure of leading 3M's global R&D organization for respiratory. It's an incredible team, world-class talent and knowledge in materials, uh, science, engineering, and perhaps most importantly, the application uh, of respiratory protective equipment. It's formed over generations. We've been doing this for over 50 years uh, and we've nurtured our people and our technologies and it takes both, uh, not one or the other. Um, and it is this foundation that allowed us to meet uh, the uh, unprecedented challenges of this pandemic head on from day one. And for us, day one started at the end of 2019 not when not the rest of the rest world of the started to hear about it. Um, when we uh, first heard about this, we quickly formed what we call an emergency response team, an ERT, uh, with senior leaders of our cross functions. It's worth mentioning at that point, we were also dealing with uh, crises in Australia, uh, with the wildfires there and on the West Coast of the United States, uh, not to mention uh, a crisis uh, in the Philippines as well. So pivoting all of our resources at that time uh, required the knowledge and skill set that we had already built prior to the pandemic. Next slide, please. So what did that foundation allow us to do? Well, it allowed us to quickly turn our plants on to 24 seven operations. Um, as all of you out there who are in engineering know, that's not trivial. Um, staffing, raw materials, uh, electrics, energy, you've heard of energy crises happening, uh, different crises like that and so on, uh, have been part of what we had to challenge. Um, but again, one of the other foundational elements we had was that because of past uh, pandemic scares and ERTs, we had actually built equipment that had excess capacity. So instead of just being able to go to uh, more of, uh, or to just operating what we had and needing to build new equipment, we could take what we had for equipment already, staff that and go full speed. Um, we also of course immediately began before the screams were happening from uh, politicians, from society and so on, we were already uh, reallocating uh, financial resources and investing heavily in more equipment, um, not because of what 3M needed, but because of the social imperative. Um, at the same time, and this is critical, um, as the leader of the organization, we also went to working from home prior even to what you heard generally in the United States. Uh, we had people in China, in the United States labs, in Europe labs, uh, working from home almost immediately um, and only going into the labs when necessary. This was pivotal. I couldn't afford to see our respiratory resources go down because of an, effect, an infection that would have a spreading event inside any of our labs, not just for 3M's sake, but for, again, for the social imperative. In addition, to, establish, to achieve our goal of getting to 2 billion respirators uh, by the end of the year, uh, we needed to look upstream at vendors. We were putting unbelievable demands on vendors in terms of volumes and throughputs and yields. Um, and again, the foundation of having the knowledge of what we needed to specify, uh, having the knowledge of our supply chain um, were critical to what we did there. And so again, um, that was foundational elements that you couldn't wait for the pandemic to start. Um, and the other piece that we, uh, that's important to remember behind all of this is that that allows us to provide personal protective equipment that never compromised on qualification values or specification. The products that are being delivered today are the same products with the same specifications, the same qualifications that happened before the pandemic. So even though we go up to now more than 2 billion respirators a year, uh, those respirators have the same quality standards, same specifications um, and so on. And that was a critical, critical element for us throughout the pandemic. Um, so now this is an older slide. We're producing more than 100 million respirators a month uh, in the US alone. Um, and we are uh, moving at great speeds there. So at this point, slide three, please. So at this point, before the pandemic was even official, 
um, officially denoted a pandemic, I'm sorry. Um, the operations at 3M are already going at light speed. Um, but despite, despite all of these great processes, um, we know that we needed more. Um, there were articles already being written at this point. Um, I'm quoting a couple here, um, <clears throat> excuse me, but we needed more. Uh, we knew that we couldn't do it alone. Um, we were already doing things like pulling in retirees. Uh, we were pulling in working uh, partners, contract. We were working across our company I literally had a roster of the entire company's technical team that I could use to call in on anything that we needed. If I needed more technician help, I had a list of people from our industrial tapes division. If I needed more help in a plant, I had a list of people who had experience in plants and could go down and help us in some of our plants to ramp up capacity. So we're operating now at light speed. Next slide, please. Fortunately, our, um, our foundation extends to more than just an N95 disposable respirator. Certainly, this is the thing that most people associate with the pandemic uh, in terms of uh, protection. But N95 is actually a NIOSH designation for a type of respiratory protection. We can deliver that with multiple types of application uh, types of product applications. Uh, one is a reusable respirator. These uh, allow you to just change out the cartridges um, or the filters in this case. Uh, in a hospital, the filters do not fill up very quickly because the hospital generally doesn't have a lot of airborne contaminants. It's just that what they do have needs to be filtered, which means filters last a long time in a hospital and a reusable respirator could be a very good solution for an N95 product. Additionally, a powered air purifying respirator, which we affectionately call PAPRs, um, also known in hospitals, provide uh, powered air purifying, as the name implies. Now, each of these types of respirators has additional, has additional application applications. challenges. Um, one of them is that you need to decontaminate. So if you're going from one patient who might have COVID to another who you don't know, you have to decontaminate between those rooms for fear of spreading. In that, in that environment, a disposable respirator may be your preferred solution. However, if you're dealing with a ward, uh, a ward of, of patients who are all known to carry the virus, um, then the other solutions become very good and prevent you from needing to use uh, quite as many disposable respirators. This obviously also has a sustainability element, but most importantly, it allows millions of additional users who can't get their hands in the heart of the pandemic on an N95 to do that. Next slide, please. So what this allowed us to do was move our products and provide tens of millions now of more solutions to use cases for the various healthcare providers. Now, the challenge with that is healthcare providers may not be as used to working with a reusable respirator or PAPR. And so in that regard, we also needed to work with our medical uh, our, our medical division at 3M, we needed to work with both the FDA and with NIOSH to make sure that these products would be uh, usable in those environments. And perhaps even most importantly, we needed to work with the healthcare providers themselves uh, for them to understand how to use these different products. Uh, when you're used to just throwing on a cup-shaped disposable N95, and you're presented with a PAPR that has a battery and a breathing tube and a head top and a filter, it's a different scenario. So we also had to be very innovative in how we got to our customers, our newer customers in some cases, and help them while they're already working ungodly, unbelievable, uh, heroic shifts to teach them how to use some new protective equipment. Next slide, please. Now we literally have all of the 3M all of the healthcare industry, we're working closely with governments and we're trying all we can. And we're in, we're in middle March at this point, just to give you the sense here. We're now uh, about seven weeks after the pandemic has been declared, or no, not even, um, and we're, we're rocketing forward. And what's happening now is the altruism, the, the beauty of the global technical community uh, starts to really come through. Um, we, uh, myself and, and my uh, team, are getting literally hundreds, hundreds of offers of help. 
Um, and, you know, the challenge is that what we have to do is we had to stay firm on a pillar of we're providing as many qualified respirators to as many people as soon as possible. The urgency was unbelievable. There were no weekends, there were no evenings. Uh, we were working day and night and we needed to be careful that our exploration of other alternatives did not deviate from that mission. Um, and so in that regard, our corporation set up what we call the ECRT, the External uh, Collaboration Response Team. And what this was, was set up by our CTO and a group of senior leaders in our organization, including myself, uh, would meet daily and we would go through uh, the hundred or whatever list of the day uh, that were coming through because we didn't want to lose opportunities just because of our uh, intense focus on delivering respirators. Um, and so these actions were just happening every day, every day. Um, by the end of last year, uh, we had over 1,500 external collaboration requests, everything from novel forms of head fa of face pieces uh, to 3D printing uh, to various types of disinfection and so on. It was, it, again, it was one of those things that really warms your heart as a technical person to say, this is a community to which I belong. Um, and it was, it was an unbelievable time. Next slide, please. So when we started working with some specific partners here, um, some of the big ones that you've heard about probably, uh, Cummins and Ford were two of the most publicized uh, activities, but I will say there were others. So I certainly don't want to uh, just do that, but for sake of time today, I'll focus on these uh, two. Um, so Ford, one of the things that Ford did was they wanted to work with us on what they call their scrappy pepper. Uh, it was scrappy because it was made from parts of a Ford truck. Uh, the blower was actually out of the uh, air heating system, uh, the seat, seat heating system, I'm sorry, for an F-150 truck. Uh, the tube was uh, an engine tube um, and so on. And so they actually made a scrappy tapper. Um, and this provided tens of uh, about 20,000, I think in the end, um, users with a tapper that they otherwise may not have had access to. Cummins, uh, oh, and Ford also did something that was amazing, which was they sent engineers to our various facilities at 3M. We opened our plants, our highly proprietary plants um, to allow Ford engineers to help us um, and what they were able to do was allow our engineers who were very expert in respiratory to perhaps focus on another activity in respiratory that needed to get done and keep the machines running. Um, in some cases, even they just let the engineers take a breath for a minute because these folks in 3M were working unbelievably uh, long days. Um, the final story I'll tell you is about Cummins. Uh, next slide, please. And it, Cummins uh, was a very interesting situation. It started in a relationship we had with uh, Cummins via the Center for Filtration Research at the University of Minnesota. Um, they reached out to us with a filter material that they thought might be useful. Um, in the discussion, it occurred to me that while the filter material wouldn't help us, their products, their um, engine filters looked a lot like our PAPR filters, pleated media inside a plastic housing. Um, when I called them on a Friday night, um, they immediately responded very optimistically. Um, that Friday night, I sent a note to one of my engineers up in Canada. She, thinking it was unusual, but she still sent the part drawings to Cummins. We didn't have any NDA at this point, And we immediately started working together. On Saturday, we set up a cross-functional, cross-company team. CDA still not in place yet. Um, on Sunday, we had the team stood up and operational. By Monday, we were making parts, prototypes, mind you, but parts. By the end of that week, we had the CDA in place and we had new equipment on the floor at their Nielsville, Wisconsin facility. They have made hundreds of thousands of filters for us now, uh, which has provided assistance to the global uh, support network. There's also a picture there in the lower right of the Scrappy Tapper, the famous Tapper uh, from Ford, if you're ever interested. Next slide, please. So decades of investment were really critical to, to, to establishing our foundation, but then flexibility to work with new partners, to filter the partners and so on were essential. Um, we're continuing to do everything we can uh, to take care of our employees and the public as that is our highest priority. Last slide, please. 
And, you know, thank you slides, uh, always token at the end, but they have a new meaning for me in today's world. Um, I just want to thank everyone, the, the people that have helped, not just at our company, but across the world, across various companies, um, and particularly the heroes on the front line in this pandemic, our healthcare providers. Thank you all, and thank you for having me today. Thank you so much, Mr. Hanberger. This is quite an inspiring story and I'm sure we will come back to it uh, and hear more in the course of our discussion uh, in the round table. Our next speaker this morning, uh, this afternoon or this evening is Mr. Weishu Cheng. Mr. Cheng is a professor level senior engineer and the plant manager of synthetic resin plant of Sinopec Yanshan Petrochemical Company in Beijing. He has nearly 30 years of experience in the synthetic resin industry. Prior to taking up his current position, he worked in a number of posts, including as a production line engineer, workshop director, and plant manager of the Yanshan Petrochemical Company. He also served as the company's chief expert on chemical processes from 2015 to 2018. Mr. Chung holds nine patents, and in 2020, he was named Person of the Year by Sinopec for his contribution to the response to the COVID-19 outbreak. His talk today is entitled, Securing the Supply Chain for Key Raw Materials for Surgical Masks, Sinopec's Rapid Scale-Up of Melt-Blown Fabric Production. For all of our audience who are listening on the English language audio channel, Mr. Cheng's remarks will be translated simultaneously from the Chinese. And now let's hear from Mr. Cheng. Dr. Feinberg, dear experts, dear friends. Hello everyone, my name is Cheng Weishu, come from Sinopac Yanshan Petrochemical Company. It gives me great pleasure to share with you the research development of the key raw materials of surgical masks. Next slide, please. Uh, my presentation is composed of four parts. First is the background of the challenge. Second, the emergency response project, building a product line in 12 days. Third, the research development of ultra high flow melt blown raw materials False conclusion. Next slide, please. First is the background. The core materials of surgical mask is melt bone fabric composed of PP with high melt index. After high temperature melting, the filament is blown out by orifice of spinnerate into ultra fine fibers and then lasered and processed into non-woven fabric. Those ultra-fine fibers are layered in random direction with the fiber diameter about 0.5 to 10 micron, one third of a hair car. The melbourne fabric is white, soft, fluffy, with unique capillary structure, with good filtration, shielding, heat insulation and oil absorption and can be applied in many fields. It can be applied in medical and sanitary fabric, such as masks, surgical gowns, surgical protective clothing. Second, house decoration. Third, industrial fabric. Fourth, agricultural fabric. Next slide, please. Melt blown fabric is the core material of mask. Through it, the mask can achieve filtering function. It's composed of external spawn bound, melt blown bound, and internal spawn bound, all composed of PP materials. In medicine area, we also adopted the compound fabric. It's resilient, breathable, bacteria protection. It can shield from bacteria. Apart from mask, 
It can also be used to produce protective gauze, surgical cap, and bandage. Next slide, please. We can see this picture is the microstructure of mask. You may wonder that the gap between the fibers is very big, whether it can filter the virus. Though the size of virus is about 0.1 micron, but the virus cannot be independently existing. It's transmitted through the droplet about five microns. The, the melt balloon fabric uh, is anti-static. When the droplet approaches the fabric, it can be attached in the surface and cannot penetrate the mask and can protect the body. Next slide, please. So for our company, uh, why we turn into the production of fabric. We can see that in 2019, the China's PP output was 20.06 million tons, and uh, the fabric of Melbourne only counts for 4.2%. 4, 4 Starting from 2020, with the outburst of uh, COVID-19, we can saw the surge demand of surgical masks, and the key raw materials is in short set shortage. Our company is mainly engaged in crude oil exploration and refining and chemical industry. To respond to the epidemic, we turn to the research and development of raw materials of the surgical mask. We extend it to the melt blown fabric, melt blown material and masks. Next slide, please. It may seem no special, but uh, it's very complicated in production. The process can be composed of three parts. First, the nafro from the crude oil and then PP and then woven into fabrics. Next slide. Our company is the main production base of PP. Our product is mainly used in food, medicine, car, piping, and film. Next slide. After accumulation of 50 years, our company has a engineer innovation team with rich experience and undertaking the responsibility of research and development of Melbourne and fabric. Next slide, please. The emergency response project, we have built production lines within 12 days. We built the production line from scratch. We achieved the miracle of building a plant in half a month. In normal circumstances, it would take half a year. Therefore, we have pain, painstaking efforts in this pro progress. As a refining and chemical industry, we have turned to textile industry. We had little knowledge in the equipment, plant construction, original material and the standard, and we even have the, don't have the technology reserve. So we cooperated with Sinomatch, another state-owned company, immediately procured equipment, opened up green lanes, and immediately put the equipment on site. We have built a team with 15 technical experts and management within one day. A team of installation with 200, with 600 people enter into the site and start construction. Next slide, please. We also face many difficulties in revamping the old plant. The equipment could not enter the old plant because of the height of cross beam and due to the complicated internal structure and narrow space, it's very difficult for our construction. The team put up a plan to remove the equipment one meter away to the east so to escape the old beam and so to solve the issue. Next slide. 
we race against against time to achieve the construction progress. In the normal times, it would take half a year to build a production line, but due to the pandemic, we had, we we made it within fifteen days. We work around the clock, and achieved three to five workloads in one day, and we mobilized available resources to make sure the construction. So how to secure the safety on site? We have formulated a detailed plan to implement all around safety supervising. We have um, made many aspects in just one time. So in commissioning, we also implemented the commissioning and installation at the same time. We achieved it 29 hours in advance. We also trained our personnel to make sure that they could grasp the knowledge and operation as soon as possible. Thanks to efforts from all sides, we achieved the first line, production line within 12 days. Now the per, per day production achieved six tons and can be produced to six million masks. In the following one and a half months, three production lines was put into operation and put into the market, which elevated the shortage situation. Next is about the research and development of ultra high flow blown materials. The materials are the core materials of the melt balloon fabric. Faced with the quality issue, in the past, the main dominant technology is degradation with peroxide residue and low quality. Our company leveraged our advantage in the PP material technology. We have taken immediate response to scale up production. Our product is very high clean and with low odor. So we became the first company to produce high quality hydrogen regulating metal balloon fabric. The progress can be, could be complete, could be composed uh, with four parts. Uh, in 2010 to 2018, we achieved the basic research of catalyst from 2018 to 2019, we, uh, that is the trial production. In February 2020, we achieved the first trial production in the plant. In April, we optimized the process and achieved long-term production and quality improvement. Next is about the technical challenges. During production, through the refining system, cryogenic system improvement, we have we improved the catalyst feed and hydrogen feed uh, system so to improve the quality of the product. Before 2020, the main production approach is degradation approach. So compared with that, hydrogen regulating approach has the feature of uh, high whiteness and resistance. So it's more advantages in hygiene smell. It can, it's better to use the mask. From research to production, to the performance of the products, it, will, it only took three months. We have achieved stable production and a mature processing. In conclusion, in this process, Sinopac rapidly produced a product line and secured the supply chain of key raw materials. We also nudged uh, technical staff. I myself, as a 
engineer who are very proud to make our contribution in the epidemic response. So that's my experience sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Cheng, for this uh, inspiring story. I know we will also want to return uh, to hear more in the panel discussion. Now we'll turn to our third and uh, final formal speaker for presentation in the webinar, Dr. Rebecca Shipley. Dr. Shipley is a professor of healthcare engineering at University College London. She directs the college's Institute of Healthcare Engineering. Her research interests lie in mathematical and computational modeling in medicine and biology, tissue engineering, and human physiology, with particular emphasis on multidisciplinary approaches that integrate data from biological experiments, imaging, and clinical experience. Dr. Shipley's research has been awarded numerous honors, including the Rose Trees Trust Interdisciplinary Prize in 2016 for research at the interface of mathematics, computer science, and medicine. In her role as director of the UCL Institute of Healthcare Engineering, she coordinates interdisciplinary research activities within healthcare engineering across UCL Engineering, School of Life and Medical Sciences, and the hospitals within the UCL Partners Academic Health System. Her talk today is entitled, The UCL Ventura CPAP Device, Engineering a Just-in-Time COVID-19 Solution. Dr. Shipley, we look forward to hearing your remarks. Hello everyone, thank you so much for the kind introduction. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you today about our experience at UCL and with industry and hospital partners in developing a non-invasive um, breathing device for treating COVID patients. Next slide, please. So I'm going to focus today on really just telling you the story of, of um, what we did um, dating back to a year ago and, and where we've got to, as I say, really focusing on um, the story of how our teams together came together and how we very much tried to work as engineers with our healthcare and in industry colleagues to make sure that we were responding to the, the crisis and the needs that they had as healthcare providers. And then finally, I'll talk a bit about our international work and where we've got to and the challenges that I think we're still facing. So as a, as a team, um, we came together just over a year ago now in mid-March 2020, and this was really at the time in response to the COVID situation in the UK. Um, as was kindly explained in the introduction, I'm a healthcare engineer at UCL, which is a big university in London. And we um, work very closely with our partner hospital network um, throughout London, in particular University College Hospital, which is again, a big teaching hospital in London with a big critical care unit. And one of my roles at UCL is in running our Institute of Healthcare Engineering, which is essentially our interface between our engineers and our medical science community. And um, I already worked quite closely with the, the critical care physicians at University College Hospital. And now if you look back to a year ago, or just over a year ago, mid-March in the UK, essentially our position was the UK was in crisis. You know, whereas we probably wouldn't have explained it in that way running up to a pandemic when we were hit with a pandemic. Um, we weren't as well prepared as, as perhaps we should have been. Um, there's various statistics that you can read about that kind of explain why we were potentially vulnerable. But for example, we had quite a low number of critical care beds per 100,000 inhabitants, um, around 6.6 .6 compared to, for example, 34.7 for, for the US. Um, and at the time, obviously, COVID had spread from China to continental Europe, for example, Italy, and we were having our first cases in the UK. Now, the UK models of the spread of, the, of, the, um, of COVID through the population in the UK indicated that we might need up to 40,000 ventilators to treat COVID patients. So ventilators are devices that are used to essentially breathe for a patient um, whilst they're sedated, and they're essentially the the response that's needed for the most sick of COVID patients. Um, but at the time we had about three and a half thousand intensive care beds in the UK. And obviously there was a worldwide shortage of ventilators. The whole world needed ventilators at this time. 
So we were in a potentially a situation where the UK response was going to be really highly challenged and indeed it was. Next slide, please. Now the response by the UK government was to set out what they called the UK ventilator challenge. And that ventilator challenge essentially looked to corral the engineering manufacturing community within the UK to mass manufacture ventilators. Um, so that we could meet the demands, potential demands of the, the number of patients that we might be experiencing in our UK hospitals. However, we considered that this probably wasn't going to be the solution, and that was for, for numerous reasons. Um, first of all, mechanical ventilators are highly sophisticated machines, and it seemed quite unrealistic to, to expect non-medical companies to be able to make highly sophisticated machines within weeks and to deliver them and for them to be safe and effective for use on critically ill patients. And the other really significant consideration, which I think it took quite a long time to be taken on board, was the, the shortage that we had of trained intensive care staff. So even if you have an infinite supply of medical kit, you need the staff who are trained and able to use them. And um, fundamentally, we didn't have staff available to be able to use the number of ventilators that were being suggested at the time. Next slide, please. So was there another solution? Um, our proposal was to instead focus on keeping patients off mechanical ventilators. And this position really came from talking to our critical care colleagues um, at University College Hospital, who were in turn talking to colleagues around the world. So Mervyn Singer, who is a professor of, of in, intensive care medicine here at UCL, was talking to colleagues in China and Italy to understand what their experience of treating COVID patients had been. And in their experience, when, when they had gone straight to to mechanically ventilating patients, their healthcare systems had been very quickly overwhelmed. When a patient's on a mechanical ventilator, they're fully sedated. They'll usually be on a ventilator for, for weeks at a time, potentially for COVID patients. And in the UK, if someone's on a ventilator, you would normally have one-to-one -one nursing care provision. Um, so fundamentally, if we could keep people off mechanical ventilators, that would be good both for the patient, but also for preserving this very scant healthcare resource. So an alternative is a non-invasive ventilator or a CPAP device, which stands for Continuous Positive Airways Pressure. These are devices that essentially take um, pressurized oxygen. Uh, a patient's awake, but they deliver it to a patient through a tight-fitting mask. And the idea is that the, the pressure essentially splints open the lung bases and enables you to get more oxygen into the patient's bloodstream than you would do without the pressurized um, gas supply. Now, the experience in Italy and China was that um, by using CPAPs or non-invasive ventilators, instead, they were able to prevent around 50 percent of patients from progressing to needing mechanical ventilation. So instead of focusing on mechanical ventilators, we started to focus on mass manufacturing these CPAP devices, because, of course, much like all other medical kit at the time, there weren't, there weren't machines available to purchase. I think in University College London Hospital, UCLH at the time, there were 12 available across the whole trust. Um, so there was a significant um, lack of available kit. Next slide, please. Now, our team first came together, as I mentioned, in, in mid-March, and the peak of the first surge of COVID was due to hit London in the middle um, of April around the Easter weekend. So if we were going to be able to do anything, we had to do it very quickly. Um, and so essentially what we did was we went back to a previously used CPAP device called the Philips Respironics Whisperflow. It was a previously CE Mark device, but was out of patent, which meant that we were at liberty to um, reverse engineer and mass manufacture it. The reason that we focused on it was for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's a purely mechanical device, um, which means that it might be potentially quite simple to manufacture. Um, secondly, as I already mentioned, it had previously been used very widely. So it had a strong um, and extensive um, evidence base for its safety and efficacy. And thirdly, by reverse engineering and firstly mimicking it, we had the potential to get rapid regulatory approvals. And that's something that I'll come back to in a moment. But the challenge then was, would we be able to manufacture it at scale and what kind of constraints would be um, in place due to the global lockdown? Next slide, please. Now, it became quickly very clear that in order to be able to deliver this, we needed to have a combination of expertise within our team. I've already mentioned that at UCL, 
um, we're in the Institute of Healthcare Engineering, so that was the kind of engineering expertise, and we had this strong partnership with University College Hospital, where was the, there was the critical care expertise, and that was really pivotal to articulate the unmet need and how these kind of devices are used in practice in hospitals. The third piece of the puzzle was going to be the manufacturing capability, and that's where we reached out to um, Mercedes AMG um, HPP high performance powertrains, who are the arm of Mercedes that essentially design and manufacture the Formula One engines for um, the Formula One team. So, for example, Lewis Hamilton. Obviously, they're extremely good at precision engineering of gas flow systems, but also doing things extremely quickly. Um, so we reached out to them. There was an existing collaboration and set of activity between UCL and um, Mercedes. And we were very lucky that they came on board very quickly. And this, I think I'll come back to this kind of triplicate of expertise later, um, later in the talk. But I think essentially, I think the, the key message that I want to really get across today is that I think we need more of these kind of partnerships that span different sectors um, and that we take this forward as the, as the way to deliver um, engineering innovation at pace in the response to these kind of emergencies. Next slide, please. I'm going to quickly talk through the essential story and the timescales that we worked to and then give a bit of detail on, on some of the ongoing work. Um, so looking back, as I've, I've just explained, it was early March in 2020 when the need um, we identified this need for non-invasive devices to try and alleviate patients from progressing to needing mechanical ventilation. Our team first came together on the 17th of March and um, we went for a drink in the common room at UCL. So we went for a beer with our critical care colleagues. And that's how really we, we, we focused down on the CPAPs and then reached out to the Mercedes HPP team to join. They, they arrived at UCL the next day and we bunkered down. Now I mentioned already that um, the background here was that the UK focus at the time was on mass manufacturing mechanical ventilators. So at this time, we were kind of outside of, of that agenda. So we had to lobby pretty hard um, to make the case for the, for the use of CPAPs, both within the NHS and also with our government. So we first contacted the medical regulator in the UK, the MHRA, on the 19th of March. And the MHRA um, pivoted all of their processes to enable emergency authorizations of medical devices in response to the COVID pandemic. And they had a very open and collaborative approach. So from that day forth, we were in communication with them on a daily basis. And, and that kind of continuous communication was really pivotal to us enabling us to move quickly. On the 22nd of March, so um, we had produced the first prototype. So this was a reverse engineered mimic of the Philips Respironics whisper flow, which was manufactured by Mercedes and we got it back to UCL and to the hospital and started testing it in the wards in the hospital. And here I'd really like to emphasize that this kind of ecosystem of partnership between hospitals and universities I think is really important. It meant that we could be directly in the hospital testing and iterating between the engineering side and the hospital implementation and infrastructure side um, very, very quickly. Towards the end of March, it was the 24th of March, the NHS issued new guidance, basically including CPAP in its care pathway. And that was, then being reflected in, in the care pathway across, you know, in many countries across the world. So there was a, a beginning and a shift in emphasis on using non-invasive ventilation to treat COVID patients. Next slide, please. So this was the first 100 hours. So this was the kind of reverse engineering piece. On the left-hand side there at the top, you can see the Philips Respironics whisper flow that we um, got hold of. That was in the museum at the, um, in the hospital. And at the front, you can see the one the first one that was was manufactured at Mercedes HPP. And really here, I just wanted to emphasize that these first few days were, were spent testing, iterating, designing, um, et cetera, so that we could produce an exact replica of that first device. Next slide, please. So the next step for us was that we got regulatory approval on the 27th of March, um, so emergency authorization by our regulator, and that was for our Mark One device, which was the exact replica. This was, you know, this I think this um, quick response by our MHRA and ability to um, pivot processes and respond to these medical devices that were needed at such pace was was really important and really expedited um, the kind of throughput of devices into the NHS. After that, we started clinical evaluations, um, so testing the devices on patients, both at University College Hospital and then independently in sister hospitals across London. And then ultimately, our Department of Health and Social Care 
in the UK commissioned 10,000 devices on the 30th of March. Next slide, please. Now, the next challenge that we faced was that the devices are pretty oxygen hungry. Um, obviously, in the UK, and this has been replicated across the world and indeed is a huge issue globally at the moment, um, with the incredible number of COVID patients that hospitals are facing, oxygen became a scant resource and something that we really needed to think very carefully about preserving. And if you look at different types of ways of treating COVID patients, um, they use different levels of oxygen. And indeed, non-invasive devices like CPAP devices are particularly oxygen hungry. So if a patient's on a mechanical ventilator, they might be using up to about 20 litres per minute of oxygen. On some high flow CPAP devices, that can be over 100 litres per minute. And there were real concerns and indeed hospitals in the UK came pretty close to um, having real issues with their oxygen availability. So our next challenge was to essentially redesign the, the Ventura CPAP device um, to minimise its oxygen utilisation. Next slide, please. And that gave rise to our Mark II device. Um, essentially, we did a lot of work on um, the air entrainment port and also the design of the breathing circuits, which are how you connect the device to the patient. So it's the mask, the tubing, et cetera, to minimize the resistances to flow. And ultimately we were able to reduce the oxygen utilization by up to 70% so that we could get to around a 20 liter per minute flow rate to deliver 60% um, oxygen to a patient. So here on the, on the right hand picture here, you can see the Mark II device. And indeed that was the one that we then took forward to mass manufacture. But I think this, this kind of iteration again between the, the hospital needs and um, infrastructure and the design work and the engineering um, innovation work was really pivotal in getting a device that was actually usable at scale within our National Health Service. Next slide, please. So finally, that, that Mark II device was approved on the 2nd of April. Um, I don't have much time to go into it, but um, on top of that, we very quickly realized that these devices, of course, couldn't be used in isolation and that to, to use a, a, a non-invasive ventilator, you need all the kit that goes with it. So that's all the breathing circuits. That's things like oxygen analyzers, which verify the concentration of oxygen in the in inhaled air. And of course, global supply chains were heavily constrained at the time and there were international shortages of all of these devices. So we ended up needing to go through a similar process to design things like oxygen analyzers um, and other pits of parts of the CPAP circuit, which we did. Um, and ultimately, the first devices started going out to NH hospitals on the 11th of April, and the full order was delivered. 10,000 were mass, man, mass manufactured by Mercedes HPP at a maximum rate of about 1,200 a day. So that full order were delivered to the NHS for the 15th of April. Next slide, please. So very briefly, this is what the complete piece of kit looks like. You can see in the middle here the, the Ventura or CPAP device or the flow generator that connects to the oxygen hospital supplies, the pressurized oxygen supplies through a, an oxygen supply hose, and then in turn connects to the patient through a series of um, tubing, valves, filters, and then ultimately a mask or hood that connects the device to the patient. <coughs> so not only did we need to mass manufacture the CPAP device, but also these other pieces of kit. So oxygen analyzers, which weren't available for import and the UK didn't manufacture before now, and um, other pieces of kit like the, the masks and um, tubing, et cetera, were also in very short supply. Next slide, please. So ultimately we ended up with six of these MHRA emergency derogations um, and this essentially means that these devices are available and authorised for use in our National Health Service for COVID patients uniquely. So these aren't CA or CE marked devices, um, but they are available for use in the UK. And that's both the, the Mark I and Mark II devices, the oxygen analysers, and then pieces like the CPAP hoods and pressure monitors that we're still working on. So this is still very much a vibrant and ongoing project where we're, we're still designing and, and developing new bits of kit in response to ongoing needs and ongoing potential challenges and waves of COVID. Next slide, please. So has it made a difference? Um, there's a video that might show here, but I'll quickly talk through how it works. Um, essentially to date, the devices and kit have been supplied to over 125 UK hospitals. And um, they initially went out through our first surge and again, over the winter surge that we've just been experiencing and thankfully is now dying down. Um, but this stock's also available 
um, for ongoing activity and in preparation for anticipated future surges going into next winter in particular and maybe even sooner than that. Next slide, please. If you do next slide, please, it will skip the video. This is a, that was a patient who essentially um, was a bus driver who, who was one of the patients to use them at University College Hospital and recovered well. In terms of the role of mechanical ventilation versus non-invasive ventilation, um, there was a real shift in the UK um, fr from the beginning of the pandemic um, through to the kind of summer. Um, and that's kind of summarising these stats. So see these stats are from the international, uh, sorry, the Intensive Care National Audit Research Centre. And they're essentially a summary of the critical care data that has come out from the UK. If you look towards the bottom there, you can see there was a shift. Um, so the column on the right is basically patients admitted up to the end of the summer, so the 31st of August. And on the left, that's patients admitted since. And you can see there's been a real reduction of around um, 23% in the, in the number of patients that now receive mechanical ventilation and instead are being treated using um, non-invasive um, CPAP. So there's been a massive uptake in this the use of this um, method of treating COVID patients. And then other statistics relevant to kind of um, outcomes for patients have improved as well. So for example, number of days that a patient spends um, in critical care and um, discharge and um, mortality statistics have also improved really significantly. Next slide, please. So finally, I just wanted to close by talking um, a bit about our international experience. Um, we obviously came together as a team to respond to initially the needs in the UK, um, but it became very clear very quickly that the needs weren't unique to the UK. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we'd, we kind of started by taking a lead from the experience in other countries. So I mentioned that um, our clinical lead, Professor Mervyn Singer, was talking to colleagues in China and Italy. And um, really, I wanted to really just give this perspective because I think it's really important that as we continue to work through this pandemic, which is very far from over, in fact, it's probably in about the worst position it's ever has been globally, that we need to be working together across country um, um, together and not in competition. So we started by learning from the experience of other countries and we have tried very hard to continue that ethos in, in what we've done since. Next slide, please. So how did we do that? As I mentioned, it became very clear very quickly that there was a really strong need for a low cost, simple device that could be used in a range of healthcare settings and didn't depend on co complex electronics, for example, power supplies, etc. So um, this device could be useful globally and in a range of healthcare settings. There were constraints to that. Obviously, I've mentioned the oxygen utilisation and I think um, availability of medical oxygen globally is an ongoing massive issue that we should really turn our attention to as an engineering community. How did we respond to this need? Well, we did a couple of things. The first thing that we did was to release all of our designs for free, so through a zero cost license so that they could be downloaded by other countries globally and manufactured locally. That's been very popular. So we've, we've had 1,900 downloads across 105 countries. Um, Around this, we also released um, a complete kind of package of technical, clinical and regulatory support. And I think that's really important because um, actually getting a device used and being useful for um, healthcare workers in different, in different settings is much more than just releasing a device out into the wild. You need to understand how it's used locally, what the needs are, and the kind of training piece is incredibly important. So we've endeavored to do that as, as well as we can, but we've been learning a lot on the fly. Um, a massive issue, again, has been international um, supply chains. So many countries, especially low middle income countries, have had real issues in terms of being able to access the subcomponents of these kind of devices and things like breathing circuits. We've established a UK hub that can supply all of the subcomponents anywhere. Um, but that is um, an ongoing challenge. We have about 20 teams now who have gone from through the full process of design, um, manufacture, regulatory, regulatory approval, approval, testing and deployment in hospitals. And that includes countries like Mexico, Peru, Paraguay, India, Pakistan, Philippines and South Africa. We know that there's at least 8,000 devices that have been made globally and have been used in different hospitals in these kind of settings. Um, so that piece is an ongoing um, area that we're still doing a lot of work in. Obviously, the other issue is that many countries don't have the local manufacturing capability to be able to respond quickly enough um, in this kind of emergency. 
So the other thing that we've done is to supply devices directly to individual countries working with charities. Um, so, for example, we've, divide, we've supplied devices to Palestine, um, working with medical aid for the Palestinians. <coughs> Excuse me. We've supplied them to um, field hospitals in Uganda. And then Mercedes-Benz South Africa, for example, donated a thousand devices to um, the East Cape in South Africa that are being used in hospitals there. Again, one of our real challenges here has been that there isn't really an overarching international strategy about how you do this in a pandemic. So we've worked, we've tried to work very closely with governments and the obvious um, large international organizations. But if I'm if I'm honest, that kind of strategy has been lacking. So we have been working very closely with individual um, smaller charities and working to build partnerships as we can to enable this. But I think it's another area that there's opportunity for us to build more work around. Next slide, please. This gives you a few examples of the countries that I just mentioned, um, but they're examples where the devices, so our designs have been downloaded and manufactured locally and then approved and are being used in hospitals. Um, and they include um, India, Paraguay is, an, is a country we're still working very closely with, Mexico, um, Pakistan, Philippines, Ukraine, Uganda and Palestine. So a pretty diverse set of different countries who have all experienced different challenges. Um, but it's been a real privilege to be able to work with all of these teams. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide. Um, so the video on the right here is actually a video that we, we got a couple of weeks ago, which is, which is from Almanara Hospital in Lima in Peru. There's an amazing team of engineers in Peru who have manufactured now about 750 of these devices and got them to about 60 hospitals in Peru. And this is one ward that's been set up in this hospital in Lima where most of the patients are now on these devices. Um, so that looks very positive and you know it, it's an incredible achievement for the teams out there but um, I kind of really wanted to close by saying I think there's a huge amount more that we need to do as engineers so these kind of stories are, are su kind of success stories but at the same time in many areas of Peru there isn't access to medical oxygen um, and you know um, <laughs> there's, there's a lot that we that we essentially still need to do to support the global response. Um, our experience has, um, has kind of taught me a lot about, about the challenges of working globally in response to this kind of emergency setting. Certainly there's challenges about the balance between cooperation and collaboration versus national self-interest. I think if we look back to a year ago, about 80 countries put down um, export bans on medical kit. Um, that obviously really puts um, countries that don't manufacture locally under um, well, that puts them into a vulnerable position, not least lower middle income countries. Um, our personal experience in the UK around medical regulation has been very positive, and I think our MHRA in the UK has done an exceptional job. Um, but the international landscape for medical regulation is fragmented, and I think that presents a real barrier to how you can deploy medical devices in an emergency scenario. Another, I think, really important point which enabled us to move very quickly was the collaboration across healthcare, engineering and industry. And for our team, that worked very well because they're all essentially relationships that were already in place. Um, but it's really important to be able to understand local settings, local infrastructure and local healthcare and, and needs and to develop technologies that respond to those needs as opposed to the other way around. And I think that's that's sometimes something that we don't always get right as an engineering community too. And, and finally, um, just to plug really the, <laughs> the opportunity for academia healthcare industry partnership as well. I think um, there's so much that, more that we can do. And I think there's so many wonderful examples about how the global um, communities have responded and where these kind of partnerships have been able to deliver at pace. And I think um, it would be really exciting to discuss what we can do in that space to, to grow those kind of approaches. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll close there. Um, it's been a pleasure to be able to tell you about what we've been up to. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Shipley. Uh, we've had three truly inspiring presentations today. Uh, we're now going to move uh, in the next phase of our webinar uh, to a, a roundtable discussion. And for this component, we're gonna be joined uh, by three additional discussants, uh, one each from uh, China, UK, uh, and the US uh, to add their perspectives. 
Uh, let me welcome and <clears throat> briefly introduce uh, each of uh, these. First, uh, Dr. Dan Wang is Associate Professor of the State Key Laboratory of Organic Inorganic Composites in the College of Chemical Engineering, Beijing University of Chemical Technology. Dr. Wang has conducted research on the key technologies for the development and conduct uh, in industrialization of reusable personal protective equipment, specifically uh, in connection with COVID. Uh, the research group uh, that he uh, represents uh, is uh, proposing and using uh, user-friendly methods to decontaminate masks effectively so as to extend their service time. Uh, second, we have Mr. Matthew Roberts, company secretary and head of finance and facilities at Mercedes AMG High Performance Powertrains in Bricksworth, UK. He was instrumental <clears throat> in supporting the, the Ventura CPAP project that uh, Dr. Shipley described, primarily uh, in the commercialization and global release of open source intellectual property, drawings and build out procedures. Third, we have Dr. Daryl Hua Huang, Assistant Professor of Research uh, Biomedical Engineering and Research Radiology at the University of Southern California. Uh, his novel, PPE Group, created in collaboration with community and industrial partners over 9,000 3D printed reusable filter masks, 10,000 clinically deployable face shields, and countless ear stress relievers for mask wearers. This group's ongoing projects include a monitored ventilator splitter and a low cost 3D printed powered air purifying respirator. I might just mention that complete biographies of Presenters and discussants are available on the National Academy of Engineering website. Uh, that's nae.edu. Search uh, the keywords COVID-19 response. Uh, if I may, I'd like to begin uh, back uh, with uh, Rodney Hayenberger of, of uh, 3M. You, uh, you spoke of a number of technical challenges that you had to overcome, but you also alluded to a number of non-technical challenges, human factors, regulatory constraints, establishing and building on partnerships. Could you say just a little bit more about how you dealt with and balanced the non-technical with the technical challenges in order to achieve the results that you successfully achieved? Indeed, I could say a little bit more. In fact, I could say a lot bit more, but uh, I will try to maintain the time uh, decorum here. Um, yeah, the you know as uh, Professor Shipley referenced as well, there's a lot of regulatory and trade barriers that we were dealing with throughout the epide epidemic, and one of the challenges, of course, was that they continued to shift. Um, right at one point, you couldn't deliver, you couldn't uh, export BMF materials out of Korea. At another time, you couldn't export FFP threes out of Russia. At another point, you couldn't deliver anything out of the United States. So there were all of these shifting criteria. And so, in that case, what you're trying to do is you're balancing uh, the government affairs organization, which is working with the political organizations. You're governing, or you're working with um, uh, uh, regulatory affairs which is dealing with organizations such as NIOSH, such as uh, uh, um, FDA, CDC, et cetera, because different guidelines are coming in and everyone is trying to do what they think is best based on their slice or vision of what is happening, right? Every engineer, uh, right? If you're given a hammer, every problem's a nail. Um, and so different organizations would hammer that differently. Sorry for maybe a an unusual pun for a respirator guy. But the point was you end up with these different scenarios. And in that case, you're working together with your engineers. Um, I would be pulled into government affairs. 
first time in my life at least where I'm my work is being tweeted by the president of the United States. Um, so it's sort of strange for an engineer uh, to work in that world. Uh, at the same time, of course, also referenced by the other uh, presenters was the idea that you have to work closely with healthcare providers who are dealing with their own healthcare systems. Every country has different healthcare systems, certainly the United States does and so on. So you have a lot of your application engineering people, people who perhaps don't know as much about the product as they do about how it's used in the hospital. Um, and so you're, again, you're working very closely between those two organizations. Um, and again, all of this has to happen in real time with urgency. So you're on calls at 11 p.m. to get somebody to a hospital at 5 a.m. to help uh, a nurse who's having a problem getting a ward set up for COVID and so on. These are a couple small examples, Dr. Feinberg. So I'll, I'll stop there, but there are dozens of that kind of situation. I, I know we could go uh, on profitably to hear many more and perhaps we'll have a little time uh, later, but I would like, uh, to turn also uh, to uh, Wei Xu Cheng of Sinopec. Uh, Sinopec is a, a vast enterprise. And it was so uh, impressive to hear about the expertise on the uh, petrochemical adaptation of materials uh, for the manufacture of the melt blown material. But if I understood correctly, you had in a very brief period of time to build out a capacity for a completely new end product for the company. Were you able to do this with the engineering talent already in place in the company? Or did you have to bring in outside expertise to help you in achieving the final manufacture that uh, you set out to achieve? Could you comment on capacity, internal, and external. Thank you. Uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, our company is a big state-owned enterprise. The engineer mainly from our internal side for better construction the project is the most important project. We have established six special teams for construction, research, production, equipment, epidemic prevention, control, and comprehensive management. Thanks to the coordinate between those teams, we combine several links, including design, equipment procurement, construction, installation, commissioning, and preparation. We have formulated a very detailed time frame, even to every hour. We make sure that every link followed each other very very closely. So to achieve closely collaboration, so as to achieve a product line within 12 days. Of course, we also have some help from our suppliers, but mainly from the internal side. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a very impressive array of accomplishment. Uh, Dr. Shipley, let me turn back to you, if I may, uh, as well. Uh, in one of the Lancet papers that you alluded to, you uh, wrote that location-specific need and infrastructure must be carefully considered to allow the intervention to be used effectively and safely. Could you elaborate on this? And in particular, was it that you had to learn from different locations how to perfect the equipment, or was it that you had to adapt the equipment for uses in different settings or some of both. How did this actually work out in practice? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I think it was a bit of both. And you know, the context here was that our team hadn't worked in providing medical devices, you know, to 
to an international community before so we we learned very much as we were going but I think you know first of all our experience in the UK was obviously that we learned a huge amount from being in the hospitals from developing devices from plugging them into the and trying them out you know in in hospital wards um, and from things like understanding the constraints of oxygen supplies so so first of all that motivated our development of the mark one and then the mark two device um, but then so thinking secondly about the international context you know we started talking to teams in all of these countries across the world um, you know in some for example in cities in Lima for example um, sorry <laughs> from hospitals in cities like Lima um, you know in in the hospitals there they have they have plenty you know the, the supply of oxygen is um, is pretty well established for example if you move to um, hospitals that are in rural settings or field hospitals for for example in Uganda the 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 oxygen supply infrastructure is completely different um, so we learned very quickly about understanding what was available in those different settings and what that meant in terms of whether these kind of devices were relevant and usable, et cetera. Um, and then that also comes down to things like um, availability of power, so electrical power. So one of the reasons why these devices are useful in, in other settings is for, for settings where there isn't a, a, a robust power um, supply, um, it's useful to have a purely mechanical device, which therefore doesn't depend on that. Um, um, I think the other thing that is really important, again, is understanding, as I mentioned, the supply chain constraints. So, so the breathing circuits, which connect these devices to the patient to, to enable them to breathe and you know, similar bits of kit are needed for mechanical ventilators or even just supplying you know, face mask oxygen to patients. In much of the world, there isn't a supply chain or a robust supply chain that enables access to, to these um, breathing circuits. Um, so, you know, that leads you to think about things like sterilization and other technologies or ways of um, adapting um, adapting to, to that environment and, and what is available in those different settings. Excellent. Thank you uh, for those illustrations. Uh, very informative. Uh, I'd like now to turn uh, to our additional discussants, if I may, uh, and begin uh, with Dan Wang at the Beijing University of Chemical Technology. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you have been deeply engaged in the decontamination uh, of uh, personal protective equipment. I wanted to ask you about two particular engineering challenges. First, how to provide decontamination without damage to the protective properties of the equipment itself? And secondly, how do you determine how clean is clean enough for decontamination equipment to be reused? Could you comment on those two problems and perhaps any other specific challenges that uh, you had to overcome? Please, Dr. Wang. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Greenberg. Uh, since uh, February uh, 2020, I have been involved in a research group led by Professor Jianfeng Chen at uh, the Chinese Academy of Engineering on the key technology for development and uh, instrument suggestion of reusable masks against the COVID-19. Actually, we developed a uh, we call it a user-friendly method to decontaminate the masks, ex uh, extending the mask using time. Uh, and the method was specifically designed for household use, which uh, we, uh, involves two uh, steps. And the first step we called for um, the soaking the used mask in hot water at a temperature of over uh, 56 degree. Uh, typically in 60 to 80 degrees for 30 minutes. And uh, the temperature and the timing are based on the guidance from the National Health Commission of our country <laughs> for killing the COVID-19 virus. Uh, actually, I think the method was used for killing the virus in many biomedical uh, labs. And the sex step, we call that uh, regeneration of the electric charging 
and the, uh, briefly we dried the masks with a uh, with a standard uh, hair dryer for five to ten minutes, and the successful regeneration is confirmed by speaking the mask with small scraps of paper. And if the paper sticks, the electric, uh, electrostatic charge has been restored. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, the method was specifically designed for house use because during the uh, February, uh, uh, during the COVID-19, many people, in, uh, most of the people in China are wearing, wearing masks and the supply of masks was not enough. And, uh, for for every people, so uh, we we proposed this kind of method, and we also measured the uh, filtration filtration efficiency of the mask after using the uh, this treatment, and uh, at the at the the BFE we call that uh, the particle uh, filtration efficiency, and the PFE the particle filtration efficiency uh, was as good as the new masks after soaking them in water and then dry by a, a hair dryer. So, uh, and uh, I think uh, since as the COVID-19 pandemic became, becomes a more serious and a more global problem, the face masks and the respecters are expected to still be a very necessary and a face high demands. However, we face that the deportable, the deportable PPE type masks, which are currently in use for face masks, uh, have generated and are generating plenty of waste. And the result, uh, resultant uh, environmental problem have occurred. So uh, the ways to deal with this waste has become serious environmental discussion, which uh, we requires global competition and a joint effort. Based on this, uh, we think our studies on the, the method for reusable masks has have positive effects on decreasing the PPE waste for the time being. Uh, and as uh, your, your second question, how we determine is clean enough for the masks? <laughs> we measured the, uh, we measured the, the microorganisms uh, amounts of the new mask, of the regenerated masks, uh, and uh, the standards of the masks was uh, meet the requirements for for new masks based on uh, the standards of our our country. And uh, so, how, uh, as is it okay to kill the uh, COVID nineteen virus? As I mentioned, we followed the uh, the procedure of uh, our type called. Uh, procedure to killing the virus uh, by soaking the, 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 the masks in, uh, in wa hot water our temperature over 56 degrees for 30 minutes. And, uh, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you very, Thank much, you very much for those comments. Uh, let me uh, turn, if I may now, uh, to uh, Matthew Roberts at the Mercedes-AMG uh, High Performance Powertrains Unit. Uh, you know, it, it strikes an outsider as um, a, a bit odd that uh, Mercedes, uh, with uh, expertise that's completely outside the medical equipment field, should be able to bring uh, so effectively and rapidly design, development, and implementation expertise. Uh, what is it from the point of view of your group's uh, technical proficiency that enabled this to take place? Precision machining, design, uh, what else? And I'm very curious uh, to know whether there's anything out of this experience uh, that will someday find its way back into uh, the Formula One powertrains that uh, you work on in the main line of your work. So could you comment on those two things, please? Hi, of course. Um, you're completely right. It's um, a very unusual collaboration is the way I would word it. Um, and, and this question comes up a lot. And in any um, 
in any partnership where different people get together, whether it be companies or technical partners, um, each company has to bring its own value. So I guess the question is, what value did Mercedes bring to this technical part partnership with, um, with UCL? And um, there's four things, really, I think is the best way to explain it. Um, the first one kind of builds on what on what Becky was saying in her presentation. And actually, a presentation that was titled Just in Time. I actually think it, it could have been titled Required Yesterday. I think that was the, uh, the time frame we were actually working on at times. But, um, but the first thing is speed. Um, one thing that we're, we're very good at as a, a motor racing company is um, when you don't win on a Sunday, you have either one or two weeks to make the, the engine and the car better so that you win the following race. Um, and what does that mean? That means that all of our R&D activity in throughout the whole business is tracked in in hours. To be honest, we have we have meetings and we have deadlines that are recorded in hours. Um, so whilst the product itself was relatively simple from a design point of view, certainly by kind of Formula One standards, um, the first area where we really bought value is kind of the, the technology acceleration. Um, of proving that out, the rapid prototyping, the modeling, um, right the way through to first prototype. And, and I think there's, there's two great examples of that. Um, one, and I think really the, the, first, the first old CPAP that we took here was one that we actually bought on eBay. Um, and we went and drove and collected it. It was an old device. And within 48 hours of ordering on, on eBay, um, we had it back here, we reverse engineered it, we pulled it apart, we'd scanned it, we turned it into a computer model, and then we built a rapid prototype for testing in 48 hours. That's, that's Formula One timeframe. Um, and, and the second example was actually, again, what, what Becky mentioned at the end of the presentation. Certainly as the project went on, the demand was so high for this project um, and this product that it was almost, we couldn't supply the world. So we targeted to try and do the next best thing. Um, and that was released to the world, all of the drawings. That means that the respective countries could work with their own local supply chains to make this happen. And I've written a fair few legal agreements in my time, um, but we went on a Friday PM um, with Becky and her team at UCL. Um, we had to write the IP release documents. I had to get Mercedes globally comfortable, which is a huge organization with releasing this IP. What would that mean in terms of warranty and guarantee? Um, and then actually building the platform and testing it so that on Monday morning, we could just release it to the world again, all over a weekend. Um, so I think, I think speed, number one. Um, the second, from an engineering point of view, we have quite an open culture. Um, we have very integrated departments. That's how we win world championships. Um, we don't hide information. We hold our hands up. We try and experiment. It doesn't work and we move on um, throughout the whole supply chain. And I think that just meant that the prove out of this product could just happen in days. We just completed the feedback loop. Um, third, and, and, and I guess this one's staying the obvious, but we have a world-class facility here. Um, you can't win races without that. Um, we probably have the next best thing to a medical facility in terms of clean build operations um, when we talk about precision engineering. Um, but equally, we also have a factory. You never know what you're going to need to improve on the car um, to win the race. So we almost have a modular factory that allowed us to repurpose 30 machines in every single build and quality area in the factory within 36 hours um, in order to go to 24-7 manufacturing um, and then finally, I put attitude down as, as the fourth bullet point. Um, people who work in motor racing are a very strange bunch. They have the ability to zone out everything um, and go racing for two hours. And that's the sole goal. Um, the parallel I'll draw here is everyone was able to kind of put the noise of the global pandemic to one side. Are my family safe? Am I safe commuting to work? Am I safe working in? A factory environment where we didn't have social distancing guidelines kind of defined at that point we were learning as we go and just focus on the task at hand and and it's that can do attitude that really um, I think we helped um, deliver and drive the project forward um, against all the backdrop that was COVID going on and, and you saw the newspaper headlines from 
the UK at the start of Becky's presentation. So um, hopefully that gives an insight as to question one, what, what, what we provided. Um, two, what have, what have we learned since then? I think um, there's, there's two things, there's kind of short term and, and quite selfishly doing this project in 2020 meant that we kept our factory open. Um, that meant that we stayed um, kind of match fresh. Um, a lot of our competitors put people on furlough and closed factories. We were able to keep this place running. Um, a, we, we gave something back to, um, to the UK society, but we kept giving people a purpose, um, very good for their own mental well-being. And, and, and it also allowed us to transition when we did go racing again from June very, very quickly because we put our people to work, albeit under a different discipline. Um, you said, what is, is there anything that we, we now bring to our, to our motor racing as a direct result? And, and I'll end on, there is. There's one big thing um, that we see as a huge success. Um, when we were building the CPAPs, we had to completely repurpose our site. And where they were built and kind of done the final quality check before it was ready to be packaged, couldn't have been any further away from the dispatch area. Um, in a world of social distancing and, and making 10,000, every 15 minutes, we'd have literally had people walking from one end of the site right the way to the other end of the site, passing and potentially contaminating many more people along the way. Um, so we introduced it, um, and, and I think it's called, we call it the robot, um, but it's kind of an automated vehicle that um, we think within about six hours, we managed to get hold of this vehicle from a very kind technical partner of ours. Um, and then we taught it the layout of our factory um, and we set it up so that at 15 minute intervals, it would literally travel from one end all by itself, from one end of the factory to the other, collect a load of finished product, bring it across the factory to the other side um, and take it to the dispatch area where we package it up. Um, we still have those in some areas of the business and um, we're still operating in social distancing conditions. So they're still here. But, um, but that kind of posed a bigger question of why don't we do more in the world of um, automated support and robotics? And one of the problems we had last year is um, when, you, when you take the turbocharger in and out of the engine, it's a two person job. And, and the only way to do it is for two people to work within less than one meter, which is, as we know, is a huge no no. Um, so we actually got the, um, the automation team to build a robot that played the role of the second person. So now that is a, a one person job using the arms of a robot um, on the other side. So, so it was because of that, it was purely because of CPAP that it opened our eyes and went, what else can we do with, with robots? Which we're still doing to this day and hopefully we can do more using that. Hopefully that covers both your questions. Indeed, that, that's a fascinating uh, tale of adaptation. We, uh, uh, I think we can all learn something from the way that was accomplished uh, at uh, Mercedes uh, AMG. Uh, I would uh, like now to turn to uh, Daryl Hua Huang uh, at the University of Southern California, uh, because your approach uh, really had some uh, great a difference to the highly centralized uh, corporate uh, uh, strategies that we've uh, heard about thus far. Uh, could you say a little bit more about uh, the way in which uh, you approach this uh, scaling up challenge with multiple diverse uh, individual sources that are part of the network uh, that make up the novel uh, PPE group uh, that you've uh, developed. Uh, and could you comment a little bit about some of the technical and human challenges in making that uh, sort of a highly decentralized system work effectively? Um, uh, oh, thank you very much. Um, and um, yes, uh, definitely. One of the things that we, uh, in, that we implemented uh, at USC was uh, an outreach to whoever could help us. And we found that through additive manufacturing, specifically 3D printing, we we're able to actually fill some of those su supply chain gaps that we we're experiencing and also create new PPE that just wasn't available and or was never thought of uh, before uh, COVID. 
a, a prime example, in the hospital for face shields, generally speaking, they only stock disposable face shields that uh, have these pieces of foam and a little bit of elastic, and they're, they're made for single use. And we looked at that and said, this is unsustainable. First of all, you can't order enough um, that you could supply our entire uh, uh, healthcare um, you know, infrastructure for one day, much less continuously uh, through the next uh, you know, several months. And so we looked into what can we do to make things that are recyclable or reusable and sanitizable. And uh, basically we're trying to find things that we couldn't find in the supply chain uh, or, or products that didn't exist at the time. And what we did then is we had to figure out, well, how do we make these, right? And with the global, uh, the global supply chain sort of being at a standstill, we couldn't just order it from someplace and have it delivered. And what we did was we went out and uh, we put out social media calls and we got this tremendous response from uh, people that were individuals that basically run 3D printers at home as hobbies. So we actually um, uh, leveraged uh, maker spaces. We leveraged um, our wonderful help from our engineering and architecture students um, who have, uh, we, we rounded up uh, over 200 printers just in the architecture um, department alone. And also uh, some uh, entertainment industry uh, help. Uh, we actually uh, worked with uh, several um, entertainment companies um, that helped assemble uh, you know, you know, unique resources and people that normally we wouldn't think about uh, in terms of, you know, in a medical um, setting. But now we have these creative uh, and very, very uh, 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 really adapt at quick turnaround and adaptation uh, individuals that came in and helped us iterate um, uh, models and uh, helped us uh, with the production side also. And so, so we basically were able to leverage both our academic um, engineering um, uh, centers, including our um, Eovine and Young um, Academy Makerspace uh, and our engineering school and our uh, School of Architecture here at SC in, in basically uh, always referring back to our medical facilities and our medical directors in suiting their needs and then having this, this iterative process that went back and forth and then going big in terms of the actual construction into the community and leveraging that, uh, that world. Would you comment uh, just uh, very briefly, Darrow, in having this highly dispersed multi-individual group working on the problem, uh, did you find that there were many innovations that then got adapted by others or uh, how did the process actually uh, work to improve the quality performance of the end products you were producing? Uh, one of the interesting um, aspects of this was uh, everything that went out uh, for production came back uh, and uh, was actually tested by our group to make sure that it was suiting our needs. And we had direct input from our infectious control um, um, uh, personnel and uh, our respiratory um, uh, support personnel. So pretty much at every, every given point uh, before we went uh, large, we, we, we double checked it with our medical staff to see if it would be useful, first of all, because there's no reason to make a whole bunch of PPE that nobody's going to use. Um, with that type of iterative process, uh, you know, we were able to keep the quality control in the design. Now, when we went out to the community, um, you know, depending on the level and skill of the uh, individual person making the uh, devices that we're, we're trying to make, um, you know, there, there could be some variability in terms of quality. But what we found is that uh, in general, uh, when we were giving them guidelines on how to do it, most of the people that were already uh, a hobbyist and enthusiast in the uh, 3D printing community knew their machines better than we could ever really know. And they were actually um, uh, feeding back to us some of the you know, pain points that they were experiencing and helping us solve those um, um, uh, points, you know, and then propagating that information to a wider community. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, turn back to our full panel uh, and ask you a question that is really for the future looking back. Uh, let us say 
in five or 10 years from now, and you're talking to uh, your children or your grandchildren or uh, perhaps to a group of students, and they want to know what was the biggest challenge that you had to overcome and what are you most proud of for what you were able to accomplish uh, in that crisis of uh, 2020 uh, in the COVID? What is it that stays with you now from the engineering achievements that you all achieved? Uh, what is it that you would convey uh, to that group of students or uh, children or grandchildren so that they will have an appreciation of what you felt was most important? I, I would like to just go around and invite each person uh, to reflect on that and comment. Uh, so could I go back in order of our speakers, uh, Rodney uh, Hanberger, to you and ask you, what, what do you feel uh, most uh, happy about overcoming or most proud in retrospect that you think you'll be talking about in five or 10 years from now? Well, I think it depends if my daughters become engineers or not. Um, my answer will vary differently. Um, I hope they do. Um, my, my core answer though, is just going to be, um, is, is much more as a person than an engineer, I'll be honest. Um, it's, it, it is what I sort of touched on in my last slide today, which is, you know, for all of the things we hear about in the world and, and for how uh, sometimes engineering is seen as a sort of colder discipline or a little bit more, um, a little bit more of a hard, discipline, let's say. Um, in the end, it was the social imperative and the unequivocal priority uh, of what we did. And because we had those skills, um, because we could apply them uh, to life, to how people needed them at the time, um, I think that that's the proudest part of all of this, is that we as engineers were saving people's lives. Um, and I don't mean me personally, I mean an incredible team of people. And I don't even mean just 3M, I mean an incredible or, uh, world and society. Um, and that for all of the negatives we hear some days, I guess I would say that that's the, that's the positive thing. That's the thing five, 10 years from now, I'll be talking to my kids about. Um, not that they're not already hearing it, but uh, I think they'd hear it again. So in short, that's my answer. Thank you very much. Uh, Wei Xu Cheng, uh, what will you be most proud to describe in five or 10 years from now? My answer is in the face of a uh, uh, pandemic, time is a priority. In emergency response, you will find your knowledge inefficient, skills inefficient, and you will find yourself in panic. And when you come down, you will find that as long as you work hard and put together, you can overcome these challenges and the difficulties. So in the future, we're full of promise and hope. So what I would like to share with you is that we must shoulder our social responsibility and contribute back to society when in times of crisis. We must work together. As long as we come together, we can overcome the challenge. We can overcome the uh, pandemic as soon as possible. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Dr. Shipley, what do you anticipate reflecting on in five or 10 years as the point that you would most like people to remember? I think um, I think my answer is very similar to the, the two previous ones, really. I think, you know, for me, I if I look back a, a year or so ago, um, you know, in many ways, I feel very conscious of a lot of the challenges that we that we faced, and I, and I think a lot of the 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 areas that still need addressing. Um, 
but actually you know if you'd asked me back at the beginning of 2020 if we'd be able to bring together a team and deliver 10,000 devices for the UK healthcare service and then do this work globally um, and actually get get devices to patients which for me that's that's the kind of piece that I'm really proud of is that you know we, we didn't just come up with a beautiful engineering solution but it was actually one that could be used and we actually got into hospitals which to be honest was, was a lot harder than some of the engineering work and um, that's what I'm really proud of and I think you know just to again reiterate um, the other comments you know I think when a lot of people think of engineering they don't think of I mean they think of, of what Matt was talking about they think of um, motorsports or automotive or um, space engineering or different areas of engineering and I really hope that the pandemic has um, you know shone a spotlight on the contribution that engineers can make in the healthcare sector and that we really you know that's how essential that is really um, and then I think my final point would just be that you know I, for me it's really not over <laughs> I think if anything I feel more conscious than ever than ever that of how much more we should be trying to do um, so hopefully in five, 10 years, there will be more stories to tell and more contributions to talk about as well. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shipley. Uh, Dan Wang at uh, Beijing, uh, what do you think you will want people to remember of your work in five or 10 years? Thank you, uh, Dr. I think that uh, after 10 years, maybe people do not remember my work, but I hope uh, that uh, uh, my <coughs> it's, I think during our study for the experiment, it's difficult to make people to believe that the masks uh, which were originally de designed for one-time use and also <laughs> can be uh, reused during that, uh, I think that, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the especially uh, time. So uh, I, I just uh, hope that the people do not have a chance to use our technologies anymore. That's all, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, and Matthew Roberts, uh, how would you respond to the question? Um, I don't really want to repeat what, what other people have said, but one of my takeaways is that um, certainly in our example, it's it's born out of a very unlikely collaboration. And, and here in the two other presentations, it feels that that's quite a common theme as well. And um, it would be a real shame if we don't learn from that. And if I, in five years from now, we're still not kind of looking outside our usual supply chains and our usual silos um, to kind of make things happen. So, so I really hope that we learn from that. And, um, and yeah, and if we can all have a slightly wider radar as to where we need to go in our daily business lives, then that'd be a, a great thing to take from this. Well, thank you. Uh, and Daryl, uh, what do you take away? And in particular, has this experience helped advance the maker movement and the involvement of many different individuals in the solution of engineering problems? Um, well, I, I, actually, that's exactly what I was going to um, uh, say was my takeaway is that the maker movement is powerful and it can help, uh, especially when, you know, situations are bad and you can't get you, you can't wait for other people to take care of the uh, the issue. And that's actually one of the things that I, I think I, I will take away with, from this is that don't wait for corporations or companies to solve the problem. You know, if there's a problem, delve into it yourself and see if you can, uh, if there's anything that you can do. And if there isn't, reach out to other people and see if you can coordinate with other people that might be able to help. And that sort of uh, echoes uh, what everybody said here is, there's a wealth of experience out there and it might not be in your realm and, and you might not expect it, but the more people you interact with, the more um, uh, you know, uh, completely different industries that you talk to, you, you can actually get unique perspectives that really, really can make a huge impact. And I think that's really the takeaway, this cooperativeness, this, this reaching out across um, uh, uh, you know, different you know, from academia to industry to the community is, um, is, is really this, we're all part of a 
sort of a, uh, a global uh, ecosystem that we should reach out into and not keep ourselves siloed. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a remarkable discussion in a very brief period of time with many important perspectives. To me as a non-engineer, it's helped reveal and to demonstrate the value of so many qualities of engineering, the ingenuity, the creativity, the flexibility, the partnership, the application to real problem solving, the speed, the scaling, and the meeting of human needs that have animated engineers uh, from the very outset. Uh, this is, of course, uh, the first of three webinars that uh, we'll be holding uh, later, uh, the second in the summer and a third in the fall on different aspects of COVID-19. Uh, in the summer, we'll focus on the questions of recovery. And in the fall, uh, the topic will really turn more uh, to resilience. There will be information about these webinars uh, posted on the several academies websites and on social media. And I might add that the very collaboration across the several academies and royal societies of China, the UK and the United States demonstrates itself the sort of cooperation that has been represented in the several examples that we were able uh, to cover. In concluding, I want uh, first to thank our speakers for their inspiring remarks, our discussants for adding so ably to our understanding of the engineering response to the demands of COVID. I want especially uh, to acknowledge uh, and thank again, Ming Xia and Fulgent Genetics for their sponsorship and confidence uh, that have led to this webinar series. And finally, I want to thank all in our audience. I hope that you have enjoyed this webinar and we look forward to seeing you again at the second in the series this summer. Thank you all and have a good day, good evening, good afternoon.